Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming. This is the last session of the day, so I appreciate it even more if, you know, if, if it was something during the noon or, or so on. So the presentation can often be also cloud, networking made easy. So we'll be talking about, about containers, about networking. I'm Mateusz Kowalski. I also put Ben here for the credits because he's my, my teammate and most, most of the stuff that I'm, I'm talking here, it's not only my work, but you know how it is. It's, it's never one person who, uh, who works. And I work at, well, at Red Hat, this is pretty obvious from the, from the deck here, but just for the completeness, uh, mm, I'm working in the OpenShift bare metal networking team. And you know, the title is, is a bit of a game because this is, we are really called bare metal networking team. But as you will notice during the course of the presentation, it's not only about bare metal, so yeah. Okay, so shortly about myself. So I'm with Red Hat for two years now, but I've had a history with Red Hat projects for a long, long um, time. My background is academia, banking, telco, so all kind of stuff. I've seen it all. I've seen, you know, different, different types of customers, different use cases. I've seen what people try to do and try to find an excuse for that. And, and this is it, buzzwords, cloud, metal, network security. This is kind of the stuff. I don't do art artificial intelligence, even though everyone is doing this, and I won't be doing this. So this is kind of the stuff. And after I finish work, I do farming. So this is something that keeps me sane. So yeah. So this is not like photo from the zoo, but really a farm that, you know, that, that is there and, and I do stuff there. So let's start, you know, the, the real stuff, the technical stuff, why you came here. Containers on bare metal, one slide very generic about why people even think about this, why people just don't live in you know, GCP, AWS, name your cloud, whatever. Well, there are H HPC workloads, so high performance computing, and those guys, they have their own bare metal, which is fine tuned for every CPU cycle, for every GPU, whatever they do. They, they just don't do cloud because cloud is not performant enough. This connects with AI machine learning because a lot of hardware for machine learning, this is dedicated hardware. So people just buy it, put it into their data center, and this is it. Nowadays, of course, you can buy it from AWS, but three years ago, you couldn't. So, so if you wanted to do ML with GPUs, that was the only, the only thing you could do. Then we have telco customers with the edge. So in general, telco stuff, this cannot be in cloud. You have physical hardware that is installed on top of the building. This cannot be run in any, you know, in any collocated data center. It has to be physically there. Critical network equi equipment, this is somehow similar. So when you build data center, you have stuff that, that is there. Specialized hardware, this is what I, what I already said. So GPUs. Interesting use case are specialized NICs. So this is what some vendors are doing now. You have network interface, which can run its own operating system, and you can run workloads there. Of course, it's not fancy workload. You won't be doing machine learning on network interface, but you know, fancy firewalling, this kind of stuff, people do it. And benchmarking, because when you have a server and you want to know what is its performance in numbers, you, you need to run you know, on bare metal without any, yeah, without any overhead, not even talking about putting this hardware to cloud and then benchmarking. So that would be nonsense. Uh, so this slide is very generic slide. It shows a lot of stuff, but the key point, what I want you to get from this slide is that when we are talking about container networking, we may think about a lot of stuff. Because you may have, you know, Kubernetes cluster. This cluster has nodes, it has some workload and so on. Then you may have a lot of Kubernetes clusters. So when we are talking about networking, we can talk about cluster to cluster communication. We may talk about your end customer somewhere out there in the internet talking to your cluster. But you can go inside this cluster and then you have use cases like nodes in the same cluster talking with the same cluster, so talking with each other. You may have pods talking to other pods, or let's do it even more complicated. You may have pods talking to nodes or pods talking to service. So all kind of combinations from now on, after this slide, we are not talking about anything that is external to one single cluster. So we will be talking about how, how you communicate with your cluster, how you communicate within this cluster, but we don't care if you have a lot of clusters and you want 
them to talk with each other. So any you know federation, this kind of stuff, it's not here. We are focusing on, on one cluster. We will not go as deep as OVS and this kind of stuff. It's on this slide just to show you that you know there are multiple layers, and we could be talking about one particular NIC, but we won't be. So so it's also not you know kernel level networking presentations. And and yeah, of course this slide also can be taken in the way that depending where you run your cluster, it may be more or less interesting. Of course, if you just buy, you know, AWS container as a service or whatever they name it, it's super boring, there is nothing interesting. If you run stuff on your metal in data center, then the fun begins. So, so yeah, so the fun begins when we start looking from a very high level at your cluster. So you have a cluster, let's say it consists of only three nodes. It's a very small cluster, but you know, one node, one node is not a cluster. One, one node is my laptop. Let's assume that to call something a cluster, it must be three. So it's, you know, it's really distributed. And the very first question is, you know, we install Kubernetes, so we get API, we can run pods, and you can communicate with those pods, all this kind of stuff. But at some point, you get this very basic question. You know, I have three nodes. They all run Kubernetes API because this is how Kubernetes works. So how do I talk with this API? Because I have three servers, so they have at least three different IPs. What do I do? So do I need to pick a server to which I talk? This is, you know, it, it doesn't scale because you will add servers, you will remove servers. You won't be keeping a list of servers as an admin that you need to talk. So the, the very first thing to make your life as API user easier is to introduce this concept of API virtual IP. So that you will have one single IP that will have some magic behind that will make the traffic always go to some node. So that you always talk to one single IP, no matter how many nodes you have, no matter which nodes are up or down, you, you want to be able to always talk to one address, later even to a DNS name, and always land in your cluster. So, so we will get the, the API VIP for this, but you know, this is only admin persona. What happens from the perspective of the user? Because at the end you run some application, you want to make money, so probably you know you run some web store or, or whatever, and your customers want to talk to this application, and they have the same problem. So you run a pod, this pod will get IP address, Probably you will know that you create a service and then you expose pod via service, all this kind of stuff. But still, where does your service run? Because your service will get IP from a private pool, which is service network, yada, yada, this kind of stuff. Still, this is not IP address that you give to your customer because they couldn't even connect there. So again, we introduce once again, one global IP address that you give to your customers and you can get the guarantee that whenever they talk to this IP address, they will land in your cluster. So, so yeah, of course, someone could ask here now, yeah, but we could do load balancer IP as a property of the service and what's then? But I will ask you, yeah, but you are not in AWS, you are in your basement, you know, in this building, so what is your load balancer there? So, so this is something that we, um, that we introduce here, and yeah, some technologies there, so we use Keep Alive and DHA Proxy, which I will tell a bit more in a moment how, in how we do this and also why we do both. Why I'm talking separately about API VIP and Ingress VIP, this is a bit of an implementation detail, but I think it's worth mentioning, and this is because Kubernetes natively and OpenShift because we are Red Hat, so, so of course I would like to say OpenShift always, but sometimes they force me to, to say Kubernetes, same stuff anyway. From the perspective of API, Kubernetes doesn't have concept of load balancing API. All that Kube vanilla Kubernetes tells you is that you have API running on every server on specific port, thank you very much, rest of the stuff is up to you, you can buy service from someone who will manage that for you. So we need to do stuff there. With the ingress, we are a bit smarter because as Red Hat, we already have you know ingress operator and concept like this. I'm not sure who's familiar, who's not, but in general, this is the the first load balancer, this is the first entry, entry point that you can get. So we have one less problem to, to solve there. So with API, we need to solve two problems, which is how to expose the API and then how to load balance it. With ingress, we only need to solve the problem of how to expose it, because the load balancing is implemented as, as a pods and 
and that's why we, we plug it like this. Mm, also, but this is purely about the traffic distribution, you run API, you know, not in every node in your cluster. If you are doing bigger architecture, you have separated control plane from the workers and this kind of stuff. So then you suddenly realize that when you talk to API, you talk to different nodes, and when you talk to your application, you talk to different nodes. So this has also implication on, mm, on that front. Mm, and yeah, also something that we started to realize at this moment when we went from the stage of having API running on those, you know, three nodes, and then we get, okay, let's introduce load balancer, and this load balancer will be just sending traffic to, to one of those three IPs, depending what's, what's up and what's down. Sounds as easy as it could be. But then you start to realize that there are some problems, and you get this one particular customer who tells you, for example, that we don't want this, I, this IP address to float like crazy. In fact, you would like this IP address to never float to a different node unless our data center burns and, and this kind of stuff. So you need to start thinking about what are the scenarios that IP address can float. I won't be talking about Keep Alive D architecture, but in general how it works is that it exposes you an IP address which is then announced in, in our scenario in, in one L2 broadcast domain so that, so that you get for, for people from networking background, VRRP is the protocol. So in general, it's a protocol using which nodes in one subnet can agree who holds the, you know, the crown, the, the IP address. And it's well-defined protocol. It's not something that someone there invented. It's, you know, it's been there for like 50 years probably, maybe even 100 or 200, depending whom you ask. But the deal is that this protocol is very simple so that as soon as someone stops responding, you assume they died. And in, in general, it sounds okay. If your server died, it won't reply to this protocol, it won't participate anymore, which means we should remove this server from the pool. But this is Kubernetes and there is so many more stuff because what happens in a scenario that your server didn't die? It does, for some reason, Kube API stopped responding for a few seconds. It didn't even die, the process is still there, but you know, it just got hiccups and it's not replying to, to few packets. So do we want, you know, a scenario in which such a hiccup causes the IP to float? Because it has a consequence for customer. I'm not sure if it's, yeah, it's probably not written on a slide, so I should, I should explain it. Whenever we float IP address from one node to another, we are terminating TCP session. And it may sound easy, but it has consequences. And you know, most of humanity, they don't care about establishing TCP session once again, but there are people that really care about this. And for them, once they establish a session, they want this session to be, to be forever. And now we go into the part why we put HA proxy. So our topology, if I go once again, is that we have three nodes which run API. We put HA proxy in front, and then we plug keep alive D to HA proxy. We don't plug keep alive directly to the API server running there, but we benefit from HA proxy distributing traffic. Why? Because HA proxy dies less often than Cube API, and at the same time, it can distribute traffic to some other node. <laughs> so now, if I tell you again the scenario in which my Cube API got hiccups, Keep Alive D is not going to notice it because Keep Alive D only checks HA proxy. HA proxy will be up all the time, and if it goes down, then it means that you know world is really going down. But it will notice that Cube API went down. It does that at this moment, it's not going to do any floating. It just for the packet that arrives, it will send it to a different node and you will never notice it from the perspective of who holds IP. So in this scenario, for your IP to float, you need to get Cube, Cube API down and HA proxy on that node down at the same time which from our analysis means that really your node is dying. If those two things go down at the same time, you better take this node out of your cluster because it's, it's nothing, 
mm, it's nothing good. And yeah, of course, there is, this, there is this thing that you need to tune your health checks and timeouts smartly. You cannot just run defaults. You need, you know, HA proxy to notice cube API death faster than keep alive D, but you can tune it in a, in a very nice way so that you really have, you know, zero floating of the IP addresses unless, mm, unless the node is, is dying. Mm, yeah, so I have also something about the installation, but I'm not sure if this is something that we should be discussing. So how many people are aware of something like bootstrap in place concept? Yeah, you are, you are a person who implemented this, so you don't count. Okay, <laughs> so in general, let me in two sen sentences tell you a story of how you install Kubernetes cluster. If you want to install Kubernetes on three servers, you need to have four machines because you first bootstrap fake Kubernetes cluster consisting on one node on the machine which is called bootstrap, which then spawns the real cluster in your three machines. After those three machines are confirmed to have Kubernetes running successfully, you can do whatever you want with this one machine. But the point is that in order to start the installation on three nodes, you need to have four nodes. It can be your laptop, it can be stuff like this, doesn't matter, but you cannot just take three nodes and say, I would like to have Kubernetes on those three nodes. You need someone to kick it from the outside. And concept of bootstrapping place is addressing this issue. This presentation is not really about this, it's just that if someone was aware of this concept, this slide wouldn't be valid because it assumes that you have this separate bootstrap VM. But if people don't do bootstrapping place, then we don't have problem and you can continue with this story. So now I was telling you about this API V that you have a lot of nodes and you need to somehow manage how this works. And now I'm bringing forth node. So you could ask me, how do we solve the issue that during the installation time when the nodes are coming up and down and restarting and so on, your API IP, so this virtual IP, always targets the correct machine, which would mean during the installation it targets all the time bootstrap machine, and after the installation it targets only those three nodes. And the answer is as simple as priorities. So Keep Alive D is so smart in the way that we configure it that we we can say it almost in simple English. As long as Bootstrap VM is up, it should hold the virtual IP. So, so this is as simple as, um, as that, and it's like really in Keep Alive D, if someone does it, it's, it's two lines of code. You could ask now, if we go deeper into installation process, but yeah, but Cube API on this Bootstrap VM also sometimes reboots and whatnot. So don't you have a problem that your API IP escapes to those three nodes that are still in the process of installation? The answer is yes, it happens I think once or twice during the installation from what we benchmarked. But it's not a problem because it's only transient for a few seconds. As soon as the bootstrap API restarted, the IP goes back again there. So it's a problem that exists on paper. In reality, it's not a problem. And on this slide, yeah, I don't have any pointers, so, so you have to bear with me. You see that API V points only to the bootstrap VM. Post installation, it moves to the control plane nodes times three. So exactly what I, what I explained. And at the same time, once the installation is over, we are adding ingress IP, the one that I told you about your application. API VIP is for admin, ingress VIP is for users. Once you have your cluster up and running, then you get workers and you start introducing the ingress IP. I won't say anything more about this because it's exactly the same thing. It's easier because there is no HA proxy in between, so, so yeah, but, but the same concept. You have worker nodes, whatever the number is of them you, you want to have and, and you do it. Uh, some, some limitations of this stuff because there are, so scaling is of course the, the first thing because you notice that the, the virtual IP always stays in a single node at a time. So if you start having a lot of H HTTP requests to your Cube API, it's all going to go to one single node. So yeah, so this is something that can become potential issue. 
For this, our solution at this moment now is that you can plug your external load balancer. So not to name vendors, if you have some you know, fancy appliance that is very expensive load balancer, you can plug this one so then people will not be going to keep alive but to, but to your load balancer. This solution doesn't work today for internal cluster traffic. So whenever your cluster needs to talk to Cube API, because it happens, it will always go via hours. But you know the scale is order of magnitude different. If you have so much internal cluster traffic to the API that single node cannot handle it, you probably did something something wrong. The other problem is that Keep Alive D, in fact, the VRRP, it's isolated to a single subnet. This usually is not a problem if you deploy everything in one place, but then we have customers that, for example, keep nodes separated from each other. So imagine a cluster of three nodes and 100 workers. And then they come to us and they tell us, but you know, not every node can talk to every node because those 10 workers, they are so isolated that they can only talk with each other but not with any other worker. And you know, at this moment you see that Ingress IP is not doing the job anymore. So for this we have some other solution in the Ingress that I'm not talking at all. If someone is making notes or whatever, which I doubt, it's called sharding. It solves this issue but, but it's something, mm, something different. Uh, a bit about DNS because it's all about IP addresses till now and it's so ugly and people don't want to remember IP addresses. So in general we have this concept that you have your cluster, so you'll have you know, api.cluster.com, then you will have you know, webapp.cluster.com. You will have also API int, which is API internal, and this is for this what I told you that cluster needs to talk with, mm, with itself. But now, chicken egg problem. We are bootstrapping a cluster. So I just got three servers to my, you know, to my data center. In fact, four, because I need the bootstrap. So now, what? Like, seriously, am I trying to tell you that in order to install the cluster first, I need to go to my DNS, which I don't have because it's brand new data center. I need to install DNS somewhere first, create those records, and then start installation. So. No, it's, it's, it's bad, it's, you know, if, if someone told me to do like this, I would go to some other vendor. So, so we solve this problem by running locally core DNS as pod, but you know, implementation detail on every node from the moment it boots, creating the configuration for those well-known names that you tell us, you know, in the install configuration, so that from the very beginning of these servers being booted up, they have those records, which we tell you in the documentation, please go to your upstream DNS and configure them, but at the same time, we configure them ourselves so that if you didn't do your homework well, we do it for you so that you don't notice. Of course, if you don't do it at some point in your upstream, other stuff will, will start fading and you will not get external traffic, but at least the installation succeeds. This is kind of, you know, we don't want you to do a lot of housekeeping before you even start the installation. A bit more implementation detail there for someone who ever opened resolve con file. You always see that, you know, stuff generated by network manager, please don't modify. Then you see a lot of stuff and, and somewhere, usually if you do system D resolve D, you just see name server local host and, and then you, you keep thinking how the hell is, is it working. So one important thing is that when you run containers on a host, they, I would like to say always, but I, I cannot say that because someone will give me counterexample, they very often just blindly consume resolve conf of the host. So now what happens if I run DNS as a pod, it runs on local host, I run some other container and I tell this container, you have DNS on 127.0.0.1 and I think that it will reach core DNS. This is not true because they are namespaced. So the trick for this is to tell this other pod that your DNS is available on the external IP of this, of this server where both pods live. If you ask, yeah, but then this traffic is going out and back, this is nonsense. Thank you, kernel networking guys. 
traffic like this will never go to the wire. So even if you don't have any network interface, this traffic will just go because of, because of routing, mm, routing magic. And network manager is there because network manager tend to modify resolve conf every time you do anything with the network. If you plug, unplug the cable, it will mess with your, you know, it will mess with your resolve conf and so on. So we are using something that is called dispatcher scripts or hooks so that we always make sure that whatever happens with network manager, our config always contains the core DNS pod. So it's, it's you know, we effectively run our own DNS because we know that customers don't, don't do it um, often good. Okay, now we are changing the story completely and we are going very much into, into Kubernetes and how to run Kubernetes. So I will be talking about concept called node IP and long story short, you run Linux binary, not even Kubernetes. This binary is going to receive a traffic. So what happens at the level of Linux? You need to bind this application to some address, right? You can be lazy and you can tell it bind to, you know, to colon colon and it binds everywhere. But if you want to do stuff a bit more, you know, secure way or, or you name it, you would bind it to a specific IP address and to a specific port. So let's go Kubernetes. And if we are in a cloud scenario, so you know, you go to AWS EC2, you buy a VM, this VM has one network interface with, an, with one IP address, you don't have any problems. But now question, if I have a server which, uh, which has 10 network interfaces and 20 IP addresses, and I want to run kubelet um, with the API server, what do I do? Like, like seriously, what is my topology and where do I bind? Because I don't want to bind everywhere. I don't want suddenly to all the interfaces to be able to receive traffic to Kubelet and all this kind of stuff. So, of course, Kubelet is not stupid and it allows you to, to do this stuff. And, and this is exactly the, maybe, yeah. So you see, dash dash node IP. This is the smart, the smart parameter that means Kubelet, please bind your API to this IP address. And you know, that would be very, very easy. But now we go back to this scenario of a server with 10 network interfaces and, and so on. If I don't tell Kubelet which particular IP I want, it will do something stupid and it will select some IP. But at the same time, how, how is it going to know whether this IP is really the IP that you as an admin talk to the server? It, it has no knowledge. I have this knowledge because I was defining this API virtual IP and all this stuff, but Kubelet on its own is, you know, is as stupid as a single binary running on a single server. So we need something additional. And now, you know, OpenShift specific stuff kicks, uh, kicks in. And this is the, the component which we call bare metal runtime CFG, but, but you know, it's, it's some runtime config. And, and this is component that will be in fact responsible for configuring kubelet to always run on a proper IP address because this component knows your network topology. So it knows your virtual IPs, it knows how many network interfaces you have and all this kind of stuff so that we are bypassing the fact that kubelet logic is not smart enough. And yeah, it's not something that we can always put upstream because we don't put upstream this concept of API virtual IPs and so on. You know, it doesn't belong to, to Kubernetes upstream. It's something that is specific to, to running stuff on-prem or sometimes in a cloud. So yeah, it looks complicated and it is complicated. I will not be reading you these design details it's, it's only that I want to tell you that you have dash dash node IP param, then you have dash dash address param, which I will not explain at all, bear with this. It's confusing and you have to handle this. And also you have dash dash cloud provider to put even more fuel to this fire. And you have this table that tells you what's going to happen if you put some value or if you don't put any value and you know, it, it tells you that if you don't put any node IP, then it binds everywhere. If you put one IP, it binds to this IP. If you put two IPs, it, you think it, it will bind to these two IPs, but this is a lie, you know, and, and this kind of stuff. And then we are starting to work on a cap that will, that will allow you to say even, 
bind to any IP that is from this, this you know, this, uh, this stack. So bind to any IP, but only V4. And, you know, it's, it's really a mess. It doesn't touch the address field, and it doesn't do anything with cloud provider. But cloud provider is, is a mess, because this table is not covering everything. Because this table is not telling you, is this configuration different if you use cloud provider or not? So I want you to look into this line here. So node IP has two IP addresses, one, two, three, four, A, B, C, D. So, you know, you assume that it will bind to this IP and to this IP, which sounds reasonable. It's a very simple dual stack application that uses one IPv4, one IPv6. And remember this case because it's going to fire in a moment. Uh, we are for a moment diverging from the, from the VIPs, sorry, from the kubelet itself and going into these heuristics of our, mm, of our stuff. So if VIP is used, everything is easy to choose the node IP because we know where the API lives. You don't always have the VIP and then you have problem, but we solve this problem by saying, yes, you don't have virtual IPs, so maybe you have some strange load balancing, but you have a default route and default route will always be there. If you don't have default route, then you won't run in a long term anyway. So this is how we solve it. It's, it's you know, it's, it's very small, neat, and, but, but some people need it. Of course, there is a lot of corner cases because, you know, what if you have a lot of IP addresses in the same subnet? What if you don't have any, you know, default gateway? What if you want Kubelet to bind to multiple IP addresses? Or, interesting, what if your IPv6 address is not really IPv6? And this will be, again, remember, that's the second thing to remember. The hint, I will skip this because it's, it's purely override. Okay, go back to the first example which I show you. Two IP addresses. I want Kubelet to bind to two IP addresses. So I do it. Node IP 129 something, comma, if E80. I start Kubelet, it tells me, oh, sorry, failed to run Kubelet. Dual stack node IP not supported when using cloud provider. Oh, thank you, Kubelet. It's very nice that you told me in the, you know, in this huge table about supported configuration. So the question is, so how do you do it? How can you run? Kubelet with a cloud provider, dual stack. The answer is you cannot today. Thank you very much. The stage is yours. <laughs> no, no, like, like seriously, before 127, you, you couldn't. And, and this is it. We are hacking this around by doing some tricks in OpenShift, but in vanilla Kubernetes, you, you just cannot. The second thing from our stack, IPv6 addresses. This is RFC. I'm not going to read this RFC, but I will show you in a moment IP, IP address, which, which is simple stupid. But this RFC gives us two classes of IP addresses. And the first one is comma comma IPv4 address, like numerical. The second class is comma comma FFFF comma comma, sorry, colon colon all the time, yeah, my English sucks, whatever. IPv4 again, slash 96 looks like perfect IPv6 address, the space is so big. Now we go into programming class 101, all the standard libraries of most common languages have a function is IPv6, which you give a string which is IP address, and it's supposed to tell you true or false depending whether IP address you know, is IPv6 or not. Sounds easy. You go into implementation of this function, and it's almost always as simple as if string contains colon, return true. Well, those IP addresses perfectly match, right? <laughs> well, they, they don't really. Uh, okay, it's visible. Oh, that's luck. So, what I'm going to do, netcat-l listen on this IP address. So, ffff colon and then IPv4, exactly like RFC says, and some port. And in simple English, it means netcat, please open a socket which will be listening socket bound to this IP address. And netcat tells me, sorry, no. <laughs> okay, but it should work. Like, seriously, it should work. So what do I do? I do S trace, and I see something interesting. We won't be doing kernel, you know, kernel stuff here. I just want you to notice that in this command, listen, this IP address, it tries to open a socket which is in at six, so IPv6 socket, and it fails. In the second command, I'm telling netcat explicitly, open IPv4 listening socket on this IP address, FFFF colon, like RFC, and it succeeds. And I leave it as a homework. The name, if someone wants to Google for this, is 
IPv6 mapped IPv4 address. Thank you whoever invented this. I don't want to meet this person because it's ugly as fuck. But, <laughs> but like, like seriously, this IP address is what, on what I wasted probably like full three working days recently because someone fed my configuration, which was IPv6 configuration, with this address and I was why it's not working. And you see how far you need to go because NetCap doesn't even give you reasonable error. It just tells you bind to address invalid argument. Like, like what's invalid there? So, so life is sad. Mm. So yeah, this is the last slide in fact, kind of, kind of summary. So I joined bare metal team Yes, out of time, so one minute. <laughs> I don't bare metal thing because I thought I would be doing physical hardware bare metal. And then what do I have to deal with? Like cloud providers, because people install stuff on vSphere. People install stuff on OpenStack, which to me is cloud. To everyone, OpenStack is a cloud. But then you come and all those concepts that I told you about, they are equally valid for any vSphere deployment, for any you know, OpenStack deployment, for any private cloud. So I really, in the past half a year, needed to revise my understanding of what bare metal and what on-premise means from thinking that the only case of bare metal is the server that stands there to the case the only non-bare metal environment is AWS. And you know, it, it really breaks, breaks some concepts in your mind what you've been learning for the, for the whole life, but yeah, it is what it is. So yeah, so this is the end. We are one minute after time, so we can take questions offline or just go and get a beer or whatever because it's so late that yeah, thank you.